that, that Anthony would uh, would talk to me about doing this. Um, I've been a big fan of his and I've gone over several of his presentations, et cetera. So um, um, I appreciate this and, and I hope that y'all uh, get something out of it. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is a 160 meter vertical for a smaller lot. Um, and I, what I did is um, I worked uh, with John, K6MM, if you're familiar with John, uh, this is his original uh, antenna that I kind of tweaked a little bit um, and we'll get into that. So if I can advance, here we are, a little bit about me. Uh, I was first licensed in 71. Um, I've got just over 300 confirmed uh, mobile DXCC and I do the uh, NCART sorter. Um, and as Anthony said, I'm the um, Ohio Section Journal DX editor, the newsletter editor for Swedexa and recently had my arm twisted to be the Twin Cities DX Association newsletter out of Minneapolis. So um, it seems like a lot, but they're all very similar. So uh, as long as I can plagiarize and copy and paste, we're in good shape. So that, that seems to work out. Um, I've got what I would consider to be a modest station. Uh, until I put up the 160 meter vertical, I have the six band uh, vertical, um, a couple of dipoles, the G5 RV, and then the antenna we're about to talk about. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of me, and I would be happy to do that, um, those are my most recent QSL cards, but um, you can email me at uh, the ARL um, domain, AJB, or go to my website or visit swedexa.org, and uh, um, Anthony will be presenting for us here, and uh, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but I believe it's September, um, and you'd be welcome, certainly welcome to sit in on our meetings as well. Uh, so this is a little bit about John. Uh, John is a, um, for lack of a better term, he's a real stud. Um, he's done a lot of operating on a lot of different uh, D expeditions. Um, he's also been a DX organizer. Uh, he's been president of several clubs. Uh, he's a member of CW Ops, uh, which I am. Um, and I would kind of guess a few people in this uh, meeting would be also. Uh, but John is very well known and very active in, in ham radio. Um, so in all fairness, this antenna was basically John's idea. Uh, he was kind enough to let me uh, steal some of his slides and then modify them for what I wanted to put up. Um, and then there's another section I blended into this from John, K9YC, um, and it has to do with uh, radials, uh, ground radials underneath this thing. And uh, boy, I learned a lot from John and, and I've done verticals my, almost my whole life. I've never had a tower. Uh, but I learned a ton from John. Um, so if you get the chance, and, and I will be uploading these slides for you, I would visit his website. He's got a ton of stuff out there, really good stuff. So to make sure everyone gets the correct credit, I'm happy to do that. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take the ingredients from both of those folks and, and see what we can we, see what we can come up with. So that, that'll be the, the rest of the presentation is to show you the components and then bring them together. If you've not worked 160, um, and I had only started in 2016, so I learned a lot in a hurry. Um, and it, it's a very interesting band. Uh, the FCC doesn't regulate it by mode, uh, but there is somewhat of a gentleman's agreement. Um, so 1.83 to 1, uh, 1835 is the CWDX window, and 43 to 53 is the phone DX window. Um, and I will tell you, the majority of hams that I've run into on 160 in five years they really respect that very much. It's, it's, a, it's a nice band, so to speak. Um, I've worked some of the 160 contests and everyone's very courteous um, and patient. So I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the time I've been able to spend on 160. Um, there's some challenges with 160, however, and one is the atmospheric absorption. Um, of course, the lower the frequency, the greater the absorption. Um, and 160 meter signals expect to be weaker than they are on the other HF bands. Um, there is you know, some relationship, let's say between 40 and 80, but it just rolls off at 160. Um, and the refraction at 160 is greater than you might be used to. Um, and the one thing I've really found interesting about 160 is it's very, uh, for lack of a better term, very directional. Um, there's a ham that lives 40 miles south of here, KTV, uh, Dave Vest, and uh, we were both chasing the same countries and things, and there was stuff he could hear that I couldn't hear, and I could hear he couldn't hear, and, and we're only 30 or 40 miles away. So uh, 160 was definitely different than the other bands in that, uh, in that way. 
Um, 160 propagation is best in winter months when darkness is more prevalent. It just, it works better. Uh, right now with all the storms and things going across the country, um, you, I could get on 160 here with this vertical and I'd really be wasting my time. But in the winter or the late fall and winter, it's it's much different story. Uh, and it, so one of the challenges is noise and there's several kinds of noise, man-made of course, uh, which we all deal with. Um, and I just realized uh, a couple of weeks ago how noisy the new uh, recharger from HP laptop was. Um, so you got to pay, really pay attention to that on 160 more than the other ones. A lot of weather related static crashes, et cetera. Uh, one thing I started playing around with this year was a beverage on the ground. Um, I didn't get too far with it, but it absolutely makes a difference. Um, if you have uh, two or three or four or 500 feet that you can lay something out, uh, terminate it on one end and, and bring it in the shack on the other, um, it will make a difference. Um, and that's one thing I'm really excited about this fall is kind of getting into uh, beverage uh, antennas and, and how to receive with them. So there's something known, known as uh, top band disease. And if you've worked 160, you may suffer from this. Uh, this was first detailed by N6TR in a, in a CQ uh, magazine article. And here's some, of the, uh, here's some of the attributes. If you desire to be on the radio at sunrise and sunset and all the time between sunrise and sunset and struggle to work really weak stations and never being satisfied with your antenna system and constantly trying to upgrade, then you may very well have this top band disease. Um, it was very interesting to me in 2018, uh, I was trying to work Denmark on 160 and I ended up getting them after two and a half hours and I felt really good about it. And then I kind of sat back and reflected, there, there's not a band between 80 and, and 10 that I would even have to do on three calls to work that guy in Denmark. And yet I just put in two hours to do it. So it's a whole, level, a whole different level of challenge than 160, but I, I enjoyed that. Is there a cure for top band disease? Well, more sunspots may help that, help the lower bands. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've come up after chasing something all night or early in the morning and my wife will say, boy, did you have a good time? <laughs> it's like, I got four hours of sleep. I couldn't have had a good time. But uh, so this one kind of always resonated with me. So kind of summarize uh, my experiences with 160. The propagation is unpredictable. Uh, there are weak signals, short hops, and there's lots of noise. And one of the questions I kind of had when, when I was talked to about 160 was, you really need 10 acres of land, huge antennas, and these massive noise filters to really make a difference. Uh, and then you have the threat of contracting top band disease. So these are a few of the 160 an antennas I tried to put up. Um, here's one uh, that didn't last too long because my neighbor wasn't very friendly. Um, here's another one that was very difficult to get up in the air, um, and I didn't get good results from that. Um, so the other one, the other two are obviously uh, not legit, but this was actually a three element, 160 meter beam that was put up by uh, the Arc Radio Arcala Group, uh, OH8X. Um, and it lasted, I believe it lasted nine months and came down. And those cross pieces are Rome 25. So this is a massive, massive rotatable uh, antenna that they built. And once it came down, some of the pictures are just spectacular of, of how, uh, well, what, a, what a mess they had on their hands really. Uh, but for a while, it was a terrific uh, performer. And that's a legit picture of it. Um, and they have the stack on the left is, you know, five over five over five over five or whatever. And on the right is the 160 meter antenna. Um, and then this gentleman in the middle is making a call, but. I thought that was absolutely a terrific picture uh, contrasting the two. Um, and, and I'm running into trouble here uh, at my other location because I had an HOA and I tried maybe something like this would work. Um, but in reality, once I moved here uh, 10 years ago, I have an, an acre of ground that is grass and field and then I have an acre that's wooded. Uh, so I decided surely I could do something. So the first thing I put up was an inverted L. Um, an inverted L is essentially at this frequency, 125 feet, two inches. You go as high as you can and then take the difference out on a, on a very uh, a horizontal plane. Um, I had eight 65 foot uh, radials underneath it with a ground rod and it performed pretty darn well. I was surprised it was pretty flat um, and it absolutely did get me onto, uh, onto uh, a 160. And in my case, X was about 40 feet. 
And then this was 85 feet, two inches out this way. Um, and I actually did get out and prune it like, like you know, you should do to try to get it close. I, I didn't want to use a tuner unless I had to, because uh, I was concerned about how broadband it was. So this worked very well. Um, and a lot of guys I've talked to, they have put up inverted L's and they said, I really, it worked well enough for me. I really didn't think I needed anything else. Uh, and they just left it at that. So it's, it's a very good performer. Um, and this is just a few of the cobbled together uh, uh, pictures of it at the time. Nothing very fancy, but it did work. Uh, and it was flat enough. So if you pick an SWR of three, which seems to be a magic number, uh, this was pretty much flat enough across the band. I could use it uh, uh, with an amplifier and, and get on the air and it worked just fine. Uh, so over the two years I was using inverted L, uh, I made uh, almost 1800 QSOs, 40 entities, uh, 15 zones, and I had uh, a WAS of, of uh, work all states of 45. And there's a couple guys on this. Um, I saw Utah, Montana. I'd love to have uh, had this meeting on 160 last summer because I still don't have those two, but I mean last winter. But anyway, so it performed well enough for me. I enjoyed it, got to learn the band, got some good experience. So it, it was a good performer. The problems I had with it were a couple, and inverted L is uh, somewhat directional. Um, it, it seems to be narrow enough that there's small windows of propagation. And the end of the L uh, was in a tree that was about 15 feet from my property line. And of course, as luck would have it, my neighbors have a porch um, that they sit in all the time. And the antenna didn't bother them, but the guy uh, ropes that I had that terminated the end would swing and it seemed to bother them and they made more than a couple comments about it. Um, and, and trying to be a good neighbor, I thought, well, next chance I get for something I'm gonna put up, I'll try to alleviate that issue. Uh, but then you always have the question, can I do better? I felt like I was still missing some DX, um, although I felt like 45 entities was pretty good. Um, I certainly could do better. So I uh, wanted to research something. Um, so what I decided was, uh, you know, the old, uh, I, I have a, a six band vertical that performs equally well in all directions. Um, I kind of feel bad for you guys with the beams because you're not sure where you need to spin them. I just leave mine pointed straight up and I work whatever I can hear. So it seems a lot easier. Um, but, you know, one of the rule of thumbs might be the more wire in the air, the better. Um, I also was on a kick uh, to do some 3D printing. Uh, a couple of the guys that work for me have these 3D printers and, and what they're able to do with it are, is really, really cool. So I wanted to keep my eye out if I could apply that to the ham shack somewhere. Um, and I did a whole bunch of homework. And when you start looking at physical length versus frequency, um, I really wanted, um, I didn't want a quarter wave anymore. Uh, what I really wanted to see, what if I put more up in the air, would that be better? So I had to find a way to support 256 feet of wire basically to get it to the frequency at the bottom end of 160. Um, in the 70s, uh, my OM, KTWE, uh, we built a 20 meter halfway helically, half wave helically wound antenna uh, for a high school that my aunt was teaching at. She was a missionary nun and had very little space for an antenna. Uh, so dad started experimenting with these helically wound antennas and it worked really well. Um, so I thought maybe that would be the way to go. And I searched for 160 meter vertically, or verticals um, and pretty much uh, in first or second click, I found K6MM. I needed a few details, of course, and I had to decide what was it I wanted to get out of this or what are my requirements? Um, I wanted a proven design for other bands. I didn't want to try something that was a, uh, a knockoff for 160 that maybe someone was experimenting with. Um, must have readily available material. I am, I'm not, I am neither a woodsman or a craftsman or a, uh, a metallurgy person of any way. So it had to be something simple, it has to work in the space I have and it won't break the bank. Um, so um, I kind of decided on a shortened vertical that that would probably meet the requirements that I had. Um, if you're not familiar with a shortened vertical, there's, there's four basic components. There's a capacity hat, um, or a capacitive hat, there's a vertical radiator, there's typically a loading coil and a grounding system. So when I start drilling down on this with KC, uh, K6MM, I had to address each one of these components. Um, the purpose of the top hat um, is that it's uh, at the top, but it increases the bandwidth uh, or it lowers the resonant frequency of the antenna. It, it itself does not radiate a significant amount of, of signal, 
but it increases the effective height of the vertical radiator. Um, if you don't have a capacitive hat, uh, the RF current and the antenna decreases toward the top uh, and the upper portion of the radiator puts out very little signal. Um, so everything you're, um, basically 90% of what you're radiating is somewhat of a ground wave. Um, but if you can increase, increase the effective height, um, you can also uh, reduce the losses caused by nearby shrubs and building. And one of the intents that John had in building this was that if you lived on a, any neighborhood with a very small uh, footprint, you could put this up in the house or the, the deck or the, the overhang or whatever it is, would not have as much effect on it. So the capacitive hat, okay, that made sense. I did my homework. Uh, I went back to some really old antenna anthologies and things and brushed up on that. But the surprise I got was when it came to earth and, and ground radials. Um, Power is lost in the earth very near the antenna before it's even radiated. Um, radi uh, radials or a counterpoise can reduce, can reduce this. Um, and they make the most difference because your soil is kind of a constant. Unless you're willing to move or bring in you know, a ton of soil, uh, you're kind of stuck with the soil that you have. Uh, so it really comes down to uh, the, radi the uh, verticals in the, in the radiation area where you can make the most difference. Um, K9YC uh, encouraged me and he says, when it comes to radials, don't let the perfect become the enemy of a good. If you can only do four, do four. If you can do eight, that would be better than four. And if you can do 16, that would be better than eight. But if you can only do four, at least do four. Um, and he had had experiences where uh, folks were gonna put verticals in, but could not put in the ideal ground plane and decided not to do it. So uh, he encouraged me uh, to get down what I could get down. The radiated signal is reflected by the earth far from the antenna. Um, and of course the radiation adds to direct the signal, it shapes the pattern. Better soil helps lower the angle the most. But again, um, if the soil you have is the soil you have, you have to investigate something else. Uh, radials don't help the reflection, but they strengthen the radiated signal and that, and that, and that is what gets uh, radiate, uh, reflected, sorry. So if you just kind of look at salt water versus very good soil versus average and rocky, um, you can quickly see, and, and I imagine most of you know this, uh, these D expeditions will put those verticals right in the surf um, and they get the, the most bang for the buck. Um, in my case, just based on um, agricultural uh, drawings I found for Warren County, um, it turned out that we had average, what they would consider to be average soil. Uh, so I just kind of use that in, in some of the calculations. The other thing is, if you look at radiation resistance versus height, so radiation resistance is the actual resistance that will uh, dissipate the power. Um, so the higher you get, the higher the radiation resistance. So a quarter wave height versus an eighth wave height. Um, and then you can see the, uh, the plot here. So if you can get um, you'll get 35 ohms, for instance, if you can get uh, a vertical height of approximately 120 feet. Um, so I wasn't able to do that for sure, but it gives you an idea that the higher, the better. So we want this radiation resistance to be higher because it's the, quote, resistor that's burning the power off for you. And resistance does matter. Um, it's mostly determined by the vertical height of the radiator, which I just showed you. Um, good resistance is larger is better. Um, the ground resistance combines with the wire resistance to burn power. Um, and we want to minimize ground resistance. We want to minimize wire resistance, which really is neg negligible. Uh, and we really want the radiation resistance to be high. Um, shown another way, it might look something like this. It's a simple series circuit. Um, radiated power would be the largest resistor. So as the current flows through it, that's where you're going to get the most radiated power. You want to move that as close to the top of the antenna as you can hence the capacitive hat, because that's where the radiated power will occur. In my case, I've some extremely simple calculations. There's very little wire loss. So uh, you can essentially set that to be zero. And I set ground loss to be zero simply because I really can't change it very much. Uh, so again, in review, we want RR, or radiation resistance, to be high and RG to be uh, low. It depends on the nature of the earth around the antenna. And the variable turn the, the radial system turns out to be the variable because again I'm not going to bring in um, a gazillion pounds of dirt, so I'm going to have to go ahead and find a radial system that will um, give me the uh, reflection and the uh, 
the RG that I want. More and longer radials is typically a good idea, um, a good counterpoise or a good ground screen. Uh, one thing Dad and I had done was took um, wire mesh and laid it out. I'm trying to remember how much we laid it out, but I think it was 25 to 30 feet square um, around the, the helix, uh, the 20 meter helix. And then we had some radios go out after that. Now, we didn't really do any technical testing to see how much the radials affected the screen, et cetera, but I know it was a very good radiator. Um, so a different way to look at it, if you have a tall antenna with quote, good radials, um, we're looking at uh, the majority of the resistance is in the uh, radiated power area. So assuming the same current flows through everything, uh, that's where the most power is going to be generated. So if we actually put 100 watts into it using these ratios, you're going to radiate 81 of your 100 watts. However, if you don't have a, a good, a good uh, radial system underneath it and a short antenna, um, your radiated power, it's going to work the other way. So your ground loss is much higher. Um, your radiation resistance is lower and putting the same 100 watts in. Uh, now you can see you're basically cooking worms and you're not radiating any, any uh, signal uh, relative to the other one. So it's kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, the big thing out of this slide is that the um, uh, current is lost in lossy earth burns transmitted power before it can even be radiated. So we really knew, do need to find a way to try to offset some of that. Um, the first inverted L I had, I just had coax going out to it. I didn't have a ground, I had a ground rod, but no radials, and it worked okay. But what a difference when I had uh, eight radials underneath it. Um, the, the SWR was better, the noise was lower, and the signal uh, was much more effective. Um, so if you're looking at 160 meters uh, at a vertical, for instance, an ideal radial system might do these things. It shields the antenna from the earth. It provides a path for return current and for, and for uh, fields that are produced by the antenna. And a counterpoise provides only the return path. And I'll mention a counterpoise later. Um, so I decided based on everything I did, I really wanted a radial system. Um, and this is where I actually tried just the coax. Um, and I, I fortunately didn't have any RF in the shack, but it just didn't perform well. But I, and I kind of didn't think it would, but I, I, I was trying it all different steps. Um, so what I have used is uh, number 14 uh, wire, um, the T-A-H-N-I-T, I cannot recall what that stands for, but it's basically a uh, house wire uh, that you can get at Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, my hunch is that when I bought it in 2016, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than it probably is now. Uh, but in, in any event, it's just very simple wire. And I'll show you in a minute, there was a uh, another gentleman who had a ton of uh, Cat5 computer cable, and he just ran, uh, ran that and did a heli uh, helical winding all the way around the antenna, and it works just great. Uh, so if we're talking about, again, this antenna, the best might be 60 quarter wave wires uh, laid out as, as symmetrically as you can. Uh, a very good uh, system might be uh, many wires on the ground. The lengths might be random. Uh, and then symmetry is good, but most radio systems must be shorter in some directions. So if you don't have, you know, a circle of 100 feet that's clear, uh, you may have 20 feet on one side and 70 feet on the other, so that it's not really going to be symmetrical, but you're going to still have some wire down. Um, so in a traditional uh, system, we might want to put 60 radials of 100 or 125 feet long, um, and I got this right out of the uh, ON4UN uh, low band antenna book. Um, we would want to put the antenna in the center of an open space with a 100 foot radius. Uh, I don't know how many of you can do that. Um, I certainly could not hear. I couldn't put it in the open and, and the woods were quite a challenge. So um, I wanted to continue to try to evolve the ground system or the radial system. Um, so most of us, because we can't quite do that, we need a plan B or a plan C. So Essentially, what I determined was I needed to use as many radials as I could, each as long as, long as could fit, use a ground screen made from galvanized hardware cloth. Now, I did not do that, um, and I really at this point don't think I will um, because it, I, I'm not sure I would get any benefit from it. Uh, but I mentioned something about a folded counterpoise, and I've read about this uh, K2AV folded counterpoise. And if you're interested in this, look that up. It's 60 feet long. It's centered at the base of the antenna at 8 feet. And it evidently is an outstanding, allows that antenna to be an outstanding performer. 
Um, someday, you know, when I have some time, I'd I really would like to play around with it and see what it can do. Um, so if you're the kind of guy who likes to read about antenna theory or even try things, uh, this K2AV forward counterpoint um, might be for you. Excuse me. So K9YC, I mentioned earlier, he'd done a, um, he's done a no number of presentations. He's done a ton of experimenting, a ton of research on his own. Um, and he, he really uh, has a rule of thumb where he simply doesn't use radials longer than the vertical height of his antenna, um, which I'd never done before. All the verticals I'd ever had uh, always were some function of wavelength of the antenna. His rule of thumb has been, hey, if, if you've got a 27 foot um, uh, vertical, then your radials ought to be you know, approximately 27 feet. Um, I've not found anything to support this, um, but I have found a lot of guys that preach the same thing. So. I'm kind of on a mission this summer to prove this out and understand it. Um, current, and his theory is that current distribution causes longer radials not to work very well. Uh, if you really want to use more wire, add more radials, but not longer ones. So um, what you'll see is I used X number of 30 foot radials. And then this fall, I'll probably double that number. Just again, kind of do the homework on it to see what happens. Uh, one of the great things about this project is I felt like I was learning antenna theory and feed line, everything all over again. Um, and I, and I, was, I wouldn't call myself a guru, but I, was, I thought I was comfortable with it. And uh, it was just great. It was like learning new stuff every, every night last fall, trying to figure all this out. So his, again, uh, it's better to have more shorter radials and a few long ones. You can never have too many. Start with what you can do now and add more. Uh, resonant length matters only if you have a few radials. So his rule of thumb falls apart. Let's say you can do four or eight then you would want them to be uh, of some resonant length. But if you can do 12 or more, just have them as tall as the vertical. So I've given you all that background. I told you I would take these two different sets of ingredients and, and, uh, and put something together. So let me show you how it, what it actually looks like and how it turns out. We'll bake a cake here. So this originally was from John uh, Miller in 2009, K6MM. Uh, and his, in, he entitled it the No Excuses 160 Meter Vertical. And what it basically is, is three pieces of uh, PVC pipe that are simply overlapped, uh, two inch, one and a half, and one, uh, for a total height of 27 feet. Uh, then you take 256 uh, feet, five inches, uh, or a half wavelength of wire, and you helically wind it uh, approximately an inch apart up the entire length of it. Um, I used, again, number 14 wire. Um, put a capacitive hat on top. You can feed it directly with a uh, 50 ohm feed line. And my final product had eight 30 foot radials. So it's really not too bad, 27 feet. Um, so here's some of the steps that I'll quickly touch on. Uh, we painted it because I figured if my neighbor was not happy about rope swinging, she certainly wouldn't be happy if she looked out and saw 27 feet of PVC piping in the backyard. So I wanted to paint it, broken into some sections. I'll show you that. And then the wiring of it, and then how to helically wind it, the top cap, and then I'll give you a little bit of a summary on how it worked. Um, and fortunately, I had some grandkids that love to uh, get dirty, and I just hung, hung the three sections up and let them spray paint it with, uh, uh, um, I can't think of the, the plastic uh, spray paint. I can't think of the name of it right now. But anyway, so they, they did a real good job. Uh, depending on uh, where you're at, I can loan these guys to you. Uh, you just have to keep them for a week at a time, but they really do a good job. This is the bottom section, and this is the um, highly technical uh, interconnect. So the coax would come in and screw here, and then this is where your, your radial system connects to that black uh, binding post. Um, kind of look from the inside where this is the uh, center part of the coax connector. The actual feed, it goes to that red binding post. Uh, what I did is I just did two binding posts here for the radials. Uh, but in any event, that's kind of it. That's how you hook it up. Um, There's a little bit of a different shot uh, from the, uh, the same thing. Um, and to be quite honest, I'm, I'm uh, six foot nine. I have rather large hands. And I really struggled getting my hands in there to get these um, screws and things. Uh, and then I finally got smart and had my wife come out and do it. And it worked really well at that point. So I may have to keep her uh, if, if I'm going to do another one of these. We'll see. Um, so 
the way they interconnect, um, and this is really smart, uh, that John uses uh, Gorilla Tape. And the reason he uses Gorilla Tape is it has a tendency to swell with moisture. So um, you just kind of mark where the overlap is and you wind these so it takes up the gap between say the, the two inch uh, and the one and three quarter inch. Um, and once you slide them in and you put your bolts in and you give it a little bit of time, it is really solid. Um, it expands, it, it kind of mechanically locks it in and there were no issues with it. So that's the uh, Gorilla Tape that's on the two, ma uh, two of the three masks. Um, and then this is uh, two of the masks and I'll explain what this black ridge is in a minute. Uh, but these are just a different view of where the mass comes in one into the other. So to helically wind it, I think I mentioned to you that um, I, I was in, interested in a 3D printing project. And after reading John's web, web page, a lot of guys had complained um, that the challenge was when, as they wound it, because you've, you've spray painted it, the surface of it uh, is slick. So as you wind it, that wire has a tendency to travel. So you spend half your time going back and realigning those because you want them, they don't have to be perfect, but you'd like them to be somewhat evenly spaced. Um, so I went ahead and decided, gee, if I could 3D print a wire guide and just put it the length of the, of the pipe, um, that might be a lot easier and lock them in. So this was kind of the first generation wire guide. I went to just putting one screw here in the middle as opposed to on the ends, uh, just to save a little bit of weight. Um, you need 42 of these. Um, they're eight inches, but um, you end up putting them down the length of the pipe. But once you screw them in, like in this case, so this is where the antenna connects to the feed line. I do a couple of turns, I tape it, and it's not going anywhere after that. So I was able to, and you can see they're a little crooked, uh, but once you straighten them and bend them just a tad, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and it really worked well. And, and I went out and checked it earlier tonight just to make sure nothing had slipped. And it's they're still where I left them. So there's been no sag, there's been no slide down the pole. And that's what a bigger uh, section of it looks like. Um, but as I mentioned, John had a version where he took um, Cat5 uh, um, networking wire and stripped it, um, just simply soldered it at both ends to short it out. Then when he wound it, he used hot glue to hold it to the pipe. Um, certainly another way to do it. And, and that would have worked fine. But like I said, I really was looking for um, something to do a 3D project on as well. And, and it turned out I was very happy with it. So but this is just another way you could do it. And again, he has his actually leaning against his uh, fence. Um, and uh, it goes up into the someone into the woods. But again, the, the advantage of the capacitive hat is that it moves the radiation from lower to higher. So that fence doesn't have nearly impact it would otherwise have. Uh, then you do have the top cap, um, and I'm a little bit, um, I still look at that picture and it bothers me because it's, it's not really square, it's mostly square, but um, the brass rods were a little bit of a challenge and uh, to get them soldered uh, and make sure they all had the conductivity and then the wire stuff was a, was a bit of a challenge, but it ended up working out. So, and that's a little bit of a closer up view before I paint, spray painted it. And so the, the actual, um, the helix wire terminates at the binding post at the other end, the capacitive hat hooks into it, uh, and you're off and running at that point. Um, so this was, the capacitive hat wasn't done yet because I had to add an inner, an inner square, if you will, uh, but that's kind of what it looks like as you're sitting, you're getting close to it. Um, the question I did have as I started down this journey was, I wonder how I'll mount this thing. And John has a really unique way to do it. And, and I was, to be honest, was skeptical and it has worked fine and it survived a pretty tough winter. Um, what he did is he takes a piece of plywood, uh, which I used a weather treated board, uh, but nonetheless, and uh, he you, puts the uh, bottom cap in it, puts a threaded rod, uh, uh, three or four inches on this side and the rest of the two feet on this side. And he goes in and just finds his air and he pushes that down so it's flat. And then he simply walks up with help, I'm sure, and puts the end of the antenna in there and it slides in place, a couple of guy wires, and it has not gone anywhere. Um, I was really surprised. I don't know why. I just thought something that was 27 feet high needed more uh, at the base, but it doesn't. It works just fine. Pretty simple. So here's the SWR curve, SWR curve on mine. Um, and it's a little higher. Um, and I probably could do some uh, different things with rewinding it perhaps. 
Uh, I know one thing that throws it off from John is that since I have this spacer, the winding is more oval than round. I've not done any easy neck analysis on that to see if that actually made a difference or not. I'm not smart enough or experienced enough to know off the top of my head whether it made a difference, but I'd like to find out. But this was the SWR curve. But pretty much everything I did was either CW at the bottom of the band, FT8 or in the DX window. So I just left it like this and, and, uh, and, it, and it works fine for what I want. Uh, if I need to get up toward the um, uh, upper part of the band, you can see it really takes off and, and I would need a tuner. Uh, but I, I didn't, and I don't know if I'd be able to flatten this out, but that'll certainly be a uh, August project to try to get this a little bit better bandwidth. And it might be that I need to change the capacitive hat, make it a little bigger, um, and, and I'll kind of experiment with that. And certainly if anybody on this in this meeting has any suggestions, I'd, I'd be all over that. Um, so in, in a year's time, um, I worked uh, 602 queues, 31 entities, 15 zones, 48 states. And now the two I need are Alaska and Hawaii. Um, and I did have a, a, a ham in Greece ask me uh, what I was running because um, he was surprised that I was one of the few he could hear from the Midwest. Uh, and again, I know that has more to do with propagation than anything, but um, it still kind of gives you some juice when you're working on with something you built and you get something like that. I was also able to work into Japan and Australia with it on FT8. So uh, it performed well, it takes up less space. Uh, the very first night, just for fun, um, I was on FT8 and CW, and I worked you know, basically half the country. So uh, I had a real good time that night. Very enjoyable. This is what it looks like. Um, this is my neighbor with her porch. <laughs> I'll point that out to you. So it's kind of hidden. And, and now over a year, you know, this, this area has been covered up a little bit, so it's a little more difficult to see. But that's really from a distance. That's all there is to it. Um, I do have the, of course, the radials are spread out here, but um, that's the antenna. Uh, and these are a few other hams that have uh, built this antenna. And I just want to step through these pretty quickly. Um, there's Mike's, this is uh, in, in Germany. Uh, and this gentleman, and it's on his website, he built this thing so it can collapse. So he can actually operate winter field day on 160 by putting these together. And he has some um, jacks or something, banana plugs at the bottom. So he'll put them together, get it up to 27 feet. This is how he distributes his radials and it, and it seems to work very well for him. Um, he's using four elevated radials that are 38 meters long. Uh, he worked, as he says here, uh, 45 DXCC entities and four stateside hams. Of course, when you're sitting in Germany, it's a little bit easier to work uh, a bunch of entities in Europe, but nonetheless, he did and, and it's a good performer for him. Um, here's another one from Vermont. Uh, this person went to the trouble of nicking the, the uh, PVC to get the wire to lay into it. Um, Gail uh, came up with a unique grounding system. Um, and this is the one she uses. And um, I couldn't find any more information. I'd sent all these people emails trying to get updates from them. Um, I didn't hear anything back from Gail, but it's, it's kind of a nice construction that she did. Um, this is from Indiana. And again, this guy's right up against his fence. Um, and it seems to work very well for him. So uh, this is a gentleman in New Jersey. And again, you can see he's got it on his deck or leaning against his deck. Um, he's got some other stuff in the air that probably does interfere with it. But in any event, uh, it works great for him. Another guy in Evansville. Now this is a little more, of course, out in the open, um, the way he has his set up. And then finally, uh, this one really struck me, uh, this guy in Indonesia, Andy, because I thought, man, that looks like, I thought it was a professional tuning coil when I first looked at it. It, it just looks terrific. Um, so what a, what a nice job he did. So that's, that's it. That's the antenna. It, it works well for me in a limited area. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, Bill, we're going to get in chat. John from Idaho wants, he's interested in winter field day, Envis for this kind of an antenna. When the Envis map drops, drops below two megahertz and below, he wants to know your thoughts. Um, I don't know, that's a great question. Um, you know, assuming that the, um, assuming the vertical works like I think and, and understand it to do with a ground plane, you'd still have a, a good takeoff angle. Um, so I don't know exactly how well it would work for NBIS, unless I don't understand the question, but I think essentially the idea is, can I go straight up and down? 
And I'm not sure this vertical would work well like that. Uh, there's a question. Could that vertical be uh, oriented 90 degrees from the, uh, so it's parallel to the ground and maybe with reflector elements underneath it. Uh, the reason I ask is uh, I run the uh, state HF Ferries net uh, and in the winter time, uh, when the muff drops down, uh, even 75 meters disappears. Um, I had the very same question. Um, I originally did this presentation at the uh, QSO Today uh, Expo, which is where I think Anthony uh, saw it. Um, I had the very same question, and I, I don't know of any reason you couldn't. Um, I mean, it, the capacitive hat's going to work the same way. Uh, the grounding system, you know, would be underneath it. Uh, so to speak, you know, the length of it versus the, the width, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, but I, that would be an interesting thing to try. The other thing I'd like to try, because um, I've heard that question, but I'd like to see if I could phase it. I think phasing two of them would be really interesting as well. So I don't know, but it, it's easy enough to build and then rotate. So uh, it would be fairly easy to try. I wonder how high you'd need it off the ground so that you wouldn't have as much interaction. But that would be an easy neck exercise or something like that, I think. Great question. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Yes, yes. Which is what I really loved about this. Anthony has his hands up, Jen. Oh, Anthony? You know how to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, Anthony. Well, good good evening. Uh... I was just going to mention to those of you that haven't tried 160 before, you'll really be amazed at some of the holes that it covers up for you. Uh, in state, when things get too long on 80 meters, a lot of times, you know, with the an antenna like Bill has there, I think you're not going to have to worry too much about worrying about the end, the envis activity of it because you're going to be able on 160 to cover those close in stations a lot easier. Um, even though it stretches out, you know, when it does get long eventually, but it's still, you're going to get a lot better local coverage than you are with 80 meters, uh, even as a vertical. It's, there's a big difference between 80 meter vertical and a 160 vertical as far as close in coverage goes. And, and on the opposite side of that, you know, if you think 160 is only good for local contacts under the right conditions, uh, you can work quite good distances. You know, I run five watts all the time and my best distance so far is South Africa and uh, North Cook Island. Now those two were on uh, FT8, but uh, I've worked a number of Europeans on CW. I even, I think I got one or two on phone, not very many. So 160 is a, a band where CW skills are gonna be helpful also, because there's a lot more CW contest on 160 than there are phone contests. Matter of fact, there's only one phone contest that I know of that's exclusively 160. And that's the CQ Worldwide in January or February has uh, a CW version for 160 and a phone version on two different weekends. Well, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions or comments out there? Uh, I got a question. Um, which would be better, a coil loaded vertical or one like this, which is basically just a really long coil? The way I look at it. Um, if you could, if you could do and support a really long coil, then your radiation resistance goes up, so your efficiency goes up. So if you can somehow, you know, um, like if you were to double this at fifty-four feet, let's say, and now you've got um, a full wave helically wound, uh, that would certainly radiate a lot better. Um, the thing that I did find very interesting was switching between the inverted L and the vertical and see how the noise dropped when I did go to the inverted L. The, the noise level was much less. Um, so that is, a, that is an issue with the vertical, but that, I guess that would be another interesting experiment to go to 54 feet uh, and just double everything and get a full wave helically wound vertical. Because in theory, if it's taller then the radiation resistance would be better and your efficiency would be better. That's a great question. Okay. Anybody else? It has been a great presentation. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. And again, thank you for Anthony. I'm a big fan of his and um, I appreciate him inviting me. And uh, um, I will, up, I saw the instructions. I'll upload or send these slides to however I need to do that. I'll take care of that in a minute. 
Um, and then uh, if anybody needs anything, feel free to contact me. Thank you again. Okay. If you would send those to me, k7rex at arl.net. Okay. Care of it. And uh, hopefully they'll go through. The ARL is having some problems with their email server, fix some and not others, but I think it's working for me. Um, the thing I should have mentioned, if anybody wants to build this, um, I do have the 3D printing file for that wire guide and be happy to send that. So just kind of contact me and I'll get it to you. Okay, appreciate that. All right, well, thank you so much. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, unless we have some more questions, comments or whatever. Uh, Barry, how's it look on your end? Everything looks good, everybody for coming. Yes. We will put I put in the chat, Dan, the link to the Ohio Section Journal if you want to subscribe and get Bill's uh, weekly DX column. Okay. Uh, which I think you would all find useful. And I also put his email address in there. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Appreciate We appreciate you, Anthony. We all do.